Yeah, our first speaker today is uh, Alexandra Blevins. Uh, Alexandra is the Forest Health Specialist for the Kentucky Division of Forestry. She received her bachelor's in fish, wildlife, and conservation biology from Colorado State University, where she discovered her love of insects and eventually pursued her master's in entomology. Uh, she's been with KDF since 2017, where she entered the exciting world of forest health as a field technician on, hemlock treat on the hemlock treatment crew. She transitioned into her new position in 2019, where she continues to work towards saving Kentucky's hemlocks, as well as implementing other projects involving invasive plants and pests across the Commonwealth. She also tracks uh, forest health issues within the state and provides technical assistance to the public and other organizations on updates surrounding these threats to our woodlands. So Alexandra, um, take it away. All righty. Thank you, Joe, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, give me just a moment here and I will share my presentation with everyone. And, um, you know, I want to thank everyone out there in the audience uh, for joining us this morning as well. So, you know, as uh, Joe mentioned, I am the forest health specialist for KDF. So I pretty much uh, live and breathe forest health day in and day out. And so it seemed really fitting for me to kick things off this morning um, and discuss our major forest health issues here in the state of Kentucky. So I've got a lot to cover. So we're going to go ahead and jump right in. Alrighty, so our first major culprit here in the state is the emerald ash borer or EAB. And so this is an exotic uh, beetle species from Asia that you can see the adult pictured here. And it's actually the immature or the grub form uh, that uh, is the tree killer. Um, so these grubs will girdle ash trees and they have decimated populations across the United States um, and they're killing millions of ash trees. So what is the story with EAB and the state of Kentucky? So here you can see our state map. Um, this little critter was first confirmed in Kentucky back in 2009 and it has been moving ever since. So these counties that are highlighted in green, they are previously confirmed counties and then we have these three new additions that came out of last year. So Hopkins, Warren, and Metcalf were confirmed um, in 2021. And um, the unfortunate truth about this uh, forest pest is that, you know, it is moving westward and it will eventually one day be found in all of our 120 counties. So this is kind of the doom and gloom aspect that we will just have to learn to live with uh, the emerald ash borer. But there um, is a ray of hope or many rays of hope in the form of these great resources um, that we have available here in Kentucky through various organizations. And I wanted to highlight a couple of those for uh, folks out there in the audience. Um, so maybe you don't know this, but there is actually a treatment option for um, you know, selected uh, ash trees if you want to protect them from the emerald ash borer. And uh, so KDF has put together this treatment guide that you can see a little snippet of here. So if you have maybe a yard tree, an ash that's great and you wanna keep it there, you can provide protection from this tree uh, on an annual basis with an insecticide. And uh, this will go step by step, uh, easily walk you through that process. So if you would like to learn more about protecting your own trees, uh, you can follow that QR code there or this link right here. And uh, the next really neat thing that I wanted to mention was uh, the TreeSnap app. So, um, you know, there are tons of apps out there, but this is a really neat one um, that will allow you to become a citizen scientist and report these imperiled tree species. So whether you find a living or a dead ash, maybe on your property or maybe somewhere where you're out hiking around, um, we would love to know more information about these trees. And you can do that through this app. Um, so we need all the help that we can get. So I'll encourage folks, if you haven't checked that out, please do so. And then lastly, uh, there's the Lingering Ash Project. And so, you know, I mentioned that there are some survivor trees out there, kind of the, um, you know, sole survivors out there in a sea of dead ash. And we want to know about those special trees and learn more about why they're not being, um, you know, attacked from uh, the EAB. So um, there are some stipulations 
when it comes to lingering ash and the associated seed collection with that. But if you would like to learn more information about that project, um, you can follow this QR code down here. And then uh, the uh, Forest Health Extinction folks at UK have put together an excellent website uh, that will walk you through EAB, ASH uh, in the state of Kentucky, and then also all the facets of the Lingering ASH program. Um, so please check that out. And another uh, bit of excitement within the realm of EAB is this uh, parasitoid release and recovery program. So um, you can see pictured here, these are four different species of stingless wasps. So I know people are probably looking at these and being like, oh my gosh, uh, I don't want these released in Kentucky, but they were actually not going to harm humans with those stingers. Those are actually modified ovipositors that these wasps use uh, to lay their eggs inside, whether it's an EAB egg as seen here, or that larva that's doing all the destruction to the ash trees. And their larva will actually develop inside those um, two things and uh, they devour them from the inside out. So uh, I know it seems really gross, but they're actually uh, gonna be some great help at keeping EAB at bay. Um, so we have applied uh, a couple sites to do some new releases. And uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll get a, you know, accepted for those. So everyone keep your fingers crossed and hopefully stay tuned for more information on this uh, program. So um, that'll wrap up the updates for EAB here in the state of Kentucky. And we're going to jump right into uh, the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid update or HWA. And so if you don't know, uh, this is a tiny exotic insect from Asia, once again, that is uh, you know, decimating our Eastern hemlock populations. And so uh, they will cause mass defoliations of these hemlock trees and they can kill a tree outright in four to 10 years. So um, we're left with these scenes of these hemlock snags out in Eastern Kentucky, and uh, we're trying to stop that from happening. And so uh, just like we saw before, here is the state map for uh, HWA infestations. And so this uh, insect was first found in 2006 in Kentucky. And um, you can see in the yellow here, which is pretty much covered up, um, that is the native hemlock range. And then uh, the blue highlighted counties, that sh shows where uh, HWA infestations currently are. So um, the good bit of news is that we've kept HWA, we kind of hold the line with that one. So um, how are we doing that? So uh, I mentioned that this was first found in 2006. Well, beginning in 2009, uh, KDF actually put together a uh, insecticide treatment crew. And so uh, we have been treating hemlock trees ever since. And uh, it's a soil drench technique that you can see um, over here being applied. And uh, it's a systemic insecticide. So it'll be taken up through the roots and into the infected portion of the crown. And it will actually protect these individual hemlock trees for four to seven years. So it's a very effective treatment. And um, so you can see our current crew members here. So if you happen to see these folks out in the woods, uh, please tell them they're doing a great job. It's really hard work. And uh, another really exciting bit of information that I wanted to share with everyone is uh, last year, we hit a major milestone of treating over 200,000 trees. So, uh, you know, once again, if you see these folks, give them the credit that's due to them. And so uh, we have this uh, two tier approach. So we just saw the chemical treatments that we do, but we also have a biological control against HWA as well. And that comes in the form of these predatory beetles um, that we release and recover. And so you are seeing here, we finally heard of some success um, at our release site for one of these species of beetles. Um, it was confirmed uh, by the Virginia Tech Beneficial Insects Lab that we have both the adult and larval forms that were recovered. And so these little beetles, both the adult and the juvenile that you can see here, they um, feast solely on HWA. So they are helping us keep these populations of this pest um, you know, at bay. So this is really excellent news that we got some success in this realm. 
And so um, we will continue with that into the future. And hopefully those populations um, will continue to exponentially grow and we can use that as a future field insectary. And so um, now we're gonna jump into the realm of laurel wilt disease or LWD. And so this is a tricky one. It's an insect disease complex. And so all that really means is that we have a tiny little beetle, the red band ambrosia beetle, that is the vector or it carries around with it these fungal spores of a lethal fungal pathogen um, that kills trees. It will wilt and uh, you know rapidly kill trees. And you can see that fungus developing there in the sapwood of this sassafras tree. And so we're really concerned about our sassafras and spice bush in relation to LWD. And so uh, once again, what's happening here in the state. Uh, so this is a relatively new disease for the state of Kentucky. It was first found in these three blue counties in 2019. And then in 2020, we had that pop up in seven new counties. And, um, you know, all the way from the south to the northern border. And, uh, you know, last year we didn't find as many new county detections, but, but we still had three new county detections that you can see highlighted here in yellow in Codwell, Warren, and Hart counties. So um, as you can tell from this map, this is a rapidly moving disease, and we're not really sure of where it's going to pop up next. So we need your help if you're seeing any uh, strange looking sassafras or spice bush, uh, please report it and we'll come take a closer look. And I did just want to briefly mention, this is the national map for laurel wilt disease. So you can see Kentucky up here on the northern reaches of it. And then I wanted to take a moment um, just to highlight that Virginia had their first detection uh, last year. And look how close this is to the southeastern Kentucky border. So folks that are in these counties here, um, please be aware of your woodlands. And if you're noticing any sickly looking sassafras or spice bush, um, please report it and we'll take, uh, come out and take a closer look. So, um, you know, unfortunately with LWD, there um, aren't a lot of management options um, at this time, but we are making some uh, great leaps and bounds in this realm um, and these forms of these fungicide trials. And so uh, next spring, working with uh, Bartlett tree experts and the great folks with Ellen there at the Forest Health Extension at UK, uh, we're going to be studying the fun this fungicide in several different treatment applications um, and their results on sassafras. Um, if you don't know, we do have the national champion sassafras, maybe even the worldwide champion here in Kentucky, something to be very proud about. And we want to keep that tree happy and healthy. So this could be an excellent avenue for us to pursue. Um, so we have some major, uh, larger sites that we're doing this research on, but we're also looking for citizen scientists who would like to participate to save our sassafras. So um, you can see this invitation letter here. Um, but if you would like to read that more in depth and learn more about uh, the citizen science aspect of this project, please follow this QR code here. And um, this will take you to a survey that will uh, be able to help us to help you out. So uh, I'd encourage everyone to do that if you're interested. Alrighty, so we're going to take a very uh, 180 turn here. Um, and so those first things that we uh, presented on, those are some biotic factors or living things that affect our forest health. But now we're going to dive into the realm of these abiotic or kind of physical things that can also hurt our forests. And i um, going to definitely hone in on these extreme weather events from last year. So um, you know, all the Kentuckians out there, uh, you know, we all know that we had a really rough year uh, with severe weather. And so we're going to touch on these three events um, that happened just last year. So um, pretty much exactly a year ago, uh, it all started with this trifecta of winter storms. So not only did we get one severe winter storm, we had three of them back to back that left us with all forms of precipitation, uh, freezing rain, sleet, ice, and snow. 
And um, pretty much all regions of our state were impacted in some way, shape, or form. But it was really the eastern portion of our state that was uh, took the brunt of the storm, really. Um, a lot of these counties out in eastern Kentucky received around a, in, a half an inch of rain, uh, excuse me, half an inch of ice, plus additional snow accumulation on top of that. And um, if you don't know, uh, this is well past the bound, uh, the threshold of uh, weight that trees uh, can hold. And so this caused a lot, a lot of damage. And so some of those hardest hit counties were Elliott, Lawrence, and Jackson, just to name a few. And as with, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, the lights went off in my room. Um, I'll keep going. Uh, so, uh, KDF is always in the forefront to respond to emergencies such as this. And so, you know, taking the call to action, we had 44 foresters uh, that were uh, put on duty and they represented 30 SAL teams that were deployed and five plow operators that were on duty. And uh, they were out there clearing debris out of the roadways, um, off power lines, so other emergency responders could get in there and make sure that everyone was safe and sound. Um, so you may know some of these folks, and if you don't, uh, take a moment to learn who they are and uh, please thank them for that excellent work that they did. If you could hit that button right there. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, I had a savior, sorry about that folks. Um, all right, and so, um, you know, once we made sure everyone was safe, then our forest health program wanted to get in there and take a closer look at the types of damages that were on the landscape. So my supervisor, Abe Nielsen, he's our drone operator. So he got out there and did some localized surveys, and you can see the images here. We had uh, uprooted pines, as well as damage to hardwood crowns. So our more mature hardwoods, if they, um, their upper branches, if they were about 10 inches or larger, they just snapped under that sheer weight of ice. And then immature trees, they, um, you know, just their whole tops were snapped out. And uh, so those are the two key takeaways, but another big facet of this damage was the slope aspect. And so depending on the grade of these hills out in Eastern Kentucky, that would make the damage more severe. And this is just due to the fact that if you're on a slope, there was more ice accumulation. And this led to even some of our hardwoods being uprooted as well that you can see in this image here. And so uh, with the drone work, we're really able to hone in on these localized damages, but then uh, we wanted to kind of zoom out and get the broad scale perspective of this damage. So we were able to um, do some aerial detection surveys and get up in the air over two days and flew over these areas that you can see um, over here. Those are our actual flight lines. And I just wanted to take a moment to mention that all of uh, this work that we do is actually recognized on a national level. So um, we are pretty proud of that. And so this just uh, zooms into a cer certain portion of that flight. So I wanted to show you all uh, the pink magenta line that is a flight path. And then all of these grid cells, these are actually uh, damage points that were collected in the um, relation to branch breakage or uh, the main stem being broken or uprooted. So, you know, what Abe saw with the drone, we were able to see that from the air as well. So um, the resulting from that, a lot of damage, sporadic damage uh, from this storm. And then a mere two weeks after that trifecta of storms, we received torrential downpours here in the state of Kentucky on February 28th. And this set all kinds of new records that I am just not happy about. Um, we received you know, the largest amount of rainfall over a short period of time. We had records set with flooding in all regions of the state and the largest flash flooding event in Kentucky to date. And um, so, as you can see, when I was um, up in the air doing the uh, damage assessment for the ice damage, I also was able to see a lot of this flooding as well. So a lot of trees underwater. 
And so what exactly does this mean? Well, we know trees get very stressed out uh, when there's times of drought, but they also get very stressed out uh, when there's too much water. And, uh, you know, when water is covering these trees, it leads to poor aeration and that leads to suffocation of the roots. And it also changes uh, both chemical and physical aspects of the soil. And these two things lead to limited root function and growth. And if you add all of those things up, this is going to lead um, to just more issues. So opens the door for secondary attackers, whether it's insects or fungal pathogens and um, potentially other things. And so we're not really sure how this is going to, you know, present itself in the future for our trees, but we're thinking there's definitely going to be some future decline. Alexandra, you got about five minutes. Thank you very much. All right. And so, um, you know, if that wasn't bad enough, uh, we were hit with this tornado outbreak to finish up the year, December 10th and 11th. We had seven tornadoes with 21 touchdowns, ranging from an EF0 to an EF4. Um, and as many of you most likely know, that long track supercell traveled um, from Fulton to Breckenridge, covering over 150 miles within Kentucky alone. And it reached wind speeds of 190 miles per hour. Um, so once again, just as with the uh, disaster with the ice storm, KDF was right there, ready to be called into action. And we had 36 foresters um, that were deployed out there, clearing the way for other emergency responders to get out there. So special thanks to all those folks and the hard work that they do. And, you know, once again, once everything uh, kind of calmed down and we made sure everyone was safe, we got the drone up and this was actually out in Taylor County. Um, Abe was able to get these images for us and you can just see the sheer damage of the straight line winds. Uh, trees were uprooted, tops broken, trees completely snapped in half, mangled branches. Um, it was pretty much widespread destruction. If a tree was in that path or the track of the tornado, um, it, it was demolished. And so once again, we got that honed in image of the damage. Now we wanted to scan back out and get the broad scale assessment. So we got up in a plane again and flew over the tornado tracks and we're able to get um, those estimates from the air. So once again, uh, just zooming into that flight path, this was within uh, land between the lakes area, which was pretty much the hardest hit forested land that I saw up there in the plain. Um, and so once again, all of those cells are uh, data that was recorded for uh, main stems broken or uprooted. And so coming out of all of that, we were able to make this really informative map that we'll be distributing to folks, uh, showing the estimated uh, damages to these counties, um, ranging from uh, the lightest color being the least amount of damage to this darkest color, uh, having the heaviest impact in uh, Lyon County there. So, um, all in all, we're still working really hard um, for when folks are ready to replant out in Western Kentucky and even Central Kentucky. Um, we are in the works of getting plans together uh, to help folks get more trees out on the landscape after that horrible event. And so with that, that's gonna be the end of my presentation, but I'm going to breeze right past this section and I will put my information uh, out there for folks once I get done. But um, unfortunately, Carl Harper, he was mentioned before, he's not able to join us today, but uh, he was going to be giving the gypsy moth trapping effort for Kentucky. Uh, he's the one of the senior uh, nursery inspectors with the Office of the State Entomologist. And um, so, you know, the gypsy moth is an important forest pest, and so we don't want to forget it. And so the biggest news, um, it has a name change. So it will now be known as the spongy moth. And this is due to the fact that its uh, egg mass is spongy in nature. So try to remember that. And I'll try to remember that for the remainder of the presentation. 
Um, so here you can see uh, the trapping effort from last year. So all of these little pink dots over here, those correspond to trapping locations. And you will uh, be able to tell that they had over 5,000 traps that they put out. So that's a lot of traps. And they caught 29 moths. So you might be thinking, well, that's not really a lot, but we do not want gyp or spongy moth to be established in Kentucky. Uh, they are a, a defoliator and they really love oak and uh, we do not want them here. Uh, so here, this is a zoomed in image and you can see the number of moths that were trapped in those certain locations. And then there's one down here that actually had two moths captured. So they're going to focus in on this area. And then all of uh, these little yellow dots and some of them are larger. This shows you the pressure that we're up against. Um, you know, we're just completely surrounded by uh, all these spongy moth catches and we don't want them coming into Kentucky. And so what are they going to do next year? So I mentioned, um, you know, they had uh, that area where two moths were trapped. So they are going to do a delimiting survey and put even more traps out than last year. And so those are those two areas. And so um, really what's coming out of that, they're going to put you know, over 5,500 traps out next year. So that's a, that's a lot of traps. And um, it's a really great effort, um, you know, with our industries here in Kentucky, uh, you know, and its connection to white oak. We want to keep those white oaks uh, happy and healthy. So we are more than glad to trap these uh, spongy moths. <laughs> and so once again, uh, that'll complete Carl's presentation. And remember, it's no longer, it's the moth formerly known as gypsy moth. It's now the spongy moth. And if you have questions, I'll ask you to please contact the office of the state entomologist because they are the uh, authority in this matter. And you can find them uh, following this QR code here. And I'm, I'm sorry about the glitch with the lights and things, but, and the speed of which we got through all that information. Um, I probably don't have any time for questions, <laughs> but you're more than welcome to put them in the chat and I'll be happy to get back to folks.